If you don't have it, let me know. This is this is the problem sheet for today. Do you have a copy of this? Yeah. Yes. No. If you if you don't, please let me know. I'll get you a copy. Okay. Oh, I know he has this. This is the copy for. So the treat uh for this one. I think most of you did that correctly, except uh, some of you had problems when I told you that when you have something like this, okay, you can write it like 1 minus alpha times z only if z approaches 0, if z, if z is close to 0. So this is only true if z approaches 0. So you cannot use this in other circumstances, right? So I think this is a mistake that some of you guys made. Right? You can only use this on, on, only if that approaches zero. But I think most of you got this right anyway. So, so this is the, only the feedback I have on case one. And case two, as I just said, does everybody has a copy of the case two? I think, let me see. This two. Anybody who uh, I see one. I have one copy here. If you don't have it. This is this two. This D. This is D on the twenty second. Oh, cheers. Yeah. This two is due on the twenty second of October. So you have about two weeks to work on it, right? And you should be able to do this two, given the material we covered yesterday. You should now be able to do this too, right? Okay. So, all right. Now let me just briefly go through what we did yesterday. So yesterday we looked at definition two of extreme values, which is this picture here. So definition two says everything that goes above a threshold is an extreme value, right? So. So just a summary of what we did yesterday. So, so according to definition two, you have a variable of interest, which is x, and u, which is a threshold. If x is greater than u, then it's an extreme value. So the question is, what is the distribution of x when x is greater than u? And th this is where this result due to Pickens comes in. It says that the conditional probability of this happening given x is greater than u, approaches this as u approaches the upper end point of f. Here f is the CDF of x, right? And using this result, using this result, guys, using this result, we can argue, this is the argument, argument I showed yesterday, that you can prove that the CDF of x, which is f, is give approximately equal to this, right? And this is known as the generalized Pareto's distribution, right? So, so the GP distribution, GP short for generalized Pareto, is given by this. This is the CDF of the generalized Pareto. Under the conditions that this must be positive, Y must be greater than U, because for something to be an extreme value, it has to be greater than U. And there are two parameters, sigma, the scale parameter, positive all the time, and psi, which is the shape parameter between minus and plus infinity. This is the notation. And then the domain. We consider three cases. If psi is positive, then the domain is from u to infinity. OK? And, uh, and if, psi is, if psi is negative, 
if psi is negative, then the domain is from u to u minus sigma of psi. And finally, if psi is equal to zero, then the domain is from u to infinity. So in summary, the domain is equal to this if psi is positive or equal to zero, and it's equal to this if psi is negative, right? So we did this, and uh, then I considered the case where psi is equal to zero, and it can be shown by limiting arguments that in this case, that is in the case psi equal to zero, the CDF of the GP reduces to this, right? Okay. And then I looked at the density function, which is the derivative of CDF, is equal to this. Then I looked at the quantile. Quantile is basically, you solve this equation for y. So you set the CDF equal to p, where p is a number between 0 and 1. And then you solve for y in terms of p. And if you do that, this is what you get. So this formula here is the pth quantile of the GP distribution. In particular, the median is equal to this. So for median, you just put p equal to half. Okay. All right. Next thing is return level. All right. Return level is a special case of quantile. And uh, in this case, you're looking at the probability that that's x exceeds this one in t years, right? But, but as you know, according to definition two, according to definition two, we don't have just one data point every year. We have a multiple, de multiple extreme values every year. So if m, if m denotes the average number of extremes per year, then over the t years, there will be m times t extreme values. So the probability that x is greater than xt will be 1 divided by mt. OK? You, you follow that? Yeah? So if this is different from definition 1. In definition 1, we had only one extreme value every year. So over t years, you will have t extreme values. But here it's not that case, because we have multiple extreme values every year. So if m denotes the average number of extremes per year, then out of t years, you will have m times t extremes, right? So, so, that's the, so that's the definition of a return level, this one here. And, and using this formula here, using this formula, you can figure out that the return level is given by this. All right, this is the formula. All right, and then I considered estimation. So this is the likelihood function. And uh, this is the log of the likelihood function. And so the MLEs, or the maximum uh, MLEs of sigma and psi, are the solutions of these two equations. And if you do some algebra, if you do some algebra, this is what you will get. You, these are the two equations you will get, this and this. So you solve these two equations for uh, the maximum likelihood estimates of sigma and psi. And fortunately, there is a command in R which called fpot that can be used to solve the two, the, these two in order to get the estimates for sigma and psi. All right. And then I talked about definition three. This is the, the last of the three definitions. So in definition three, as you, as you recall, we don't just pick the largest, but the first few largest. So in this case, the first five largest, right? OK? OK, so that's definition three. So then we introduce some notation here. So MN1 denotes the largest data. MN2 is the second largest. This is the third largest. And this is the rth largest, all right? Then the question is, what is the distribution of this vector? So we want to know the distribution of this vector. And there's a result, there's a result due, due to Weissman, 1978, which says that the joint, the joint distribution of the scaled version of this, 
approaches something like this as n approaches infinity all right so where uh, gamma i is given by this a n is a n is the same a n and b n are the same as in the extremal type theorem now using this research although it looks complicated it, you can show or one can show i don't expect you to show that that the joint density function of this vector is equal to this right it's this expression here that is from this you can go to this ex exactly like what we did in definition one you may recall in definition one we went from the ETT the extremal types theorem to the GEV distribution right and I showed you how to do that but in this case it's more complicated I don't expect you to know this right you can go from this to this right after some algebraic manipulations right so this is the joint density so and uh, for estimation suppose these are the data so suppose these are the r largest data points in year one this is in year two and this is in year n so you have this array of data then the likelihood function will be this right this this will be the likelihood function and uh, the log of the likelihood function will be this right okay and then you will need to solve these three partial derivatives set to zero in order to get the estimates for mu sigma and psi yeah and um, and the the three partial derivatives after some algebra after some algebraic manipulations you can show that the partial derivatives are this this and this right okay and uh, so you need to solve the three equations one two and three in order to get the MLEs for mu sigma and psi yeah and that's all we did with then I then I talked about definition one. I went back to definition one. You may you may recall that in definition one, the, uh, to check whether the ETT holds, we need to check three conditions, right? Condition one, condition two, condition three. So condition one, if it is satisfied, that means the limit will be Gumpel. If condition two is satisfied, the limit will be pressure. If condition three is satisfied, the limit will be wider, right? But in, in practice, checking the three conditions can be time consuming, right? Especially in an exam situation. So the question was whether, is there a way to s check whether the ETT will hold without actually checking the three conditions? The answer is yes. So I gave this result this is the result I gave in the discrete case. So if x is a discrete random variable, and now you have this upper end point, then, and if this condition is equal, sorry, if the limit of this is equal to zero, then the ETT will hold. In other words, one of the three conditions will be satisfied. It doesn't say which, so you need to go back and check which of the three conditions is satisfied. Right, but if the limit, if the limit of this is not equal to zero, then it say it will say that ETT will not hold. So in that case, none of the three conditions will be satisfied. So it will save you a lot of time. It will save you a lot of time. You know, if the limit is not equal to zero, you know what I'm saying. If the limit is not equal to zero, then none of the conditions is going to be satisfied so you don't need to check any of the three conditions then I did an example I, this is an example I did I don't know whether you guys followed, followed this or not but this here you have a, a sample from a geometric distribution so this is the probability is equal to phase, this one and you can show after some you know how to find the W of F. What do you do? 
we said fx equal to 1 and solve for x here. Yeah? So you can show that w of f is infinity. And then the limit of the limit of of this divided by this becomes this, right? Which is equal to this, which is equal to p, and which is not equal to zero. And hence the extremal types theorem does not hold. Right? Was this example clear or not? I mean I did th this this was the last thing I did yesterday. Yeah. Come on guys, talk to me. Was or is it is this example clear or not? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, right. So what I'm what I'm gonna do today is to do more examples. I know some of you have been saying that I'm I'm not doing any examples, so let me let me do some more examples today. So example example so I'm done with example one. Example two. So here you have a random sample from a binomial distribution with parameters m and p. I'm sure all of you know the binomial, right? Uh, So this is the this is the uh, density function of the binomial. I'm sure you know this, right? So now the next question is, what is the W of f? What do you think the W of f is going to be? Remember the W of f. I I define. I mean, uh, another way to find W of f is to look at the domain of the density. In this case, the domain of the density is from zero one to n. And W of F is usually the largest point of the domain. So what's the largest point here? M. So W of F is usually the last, which is M. Okay? You, you follow me? Yeah. So we, we need to, so we, what we need to find, so what we need to find is the limit of the probability that x equal to k divided by 1 minus fk minus 1 as k approaches m. Right? And if this limit is equal to 0, then the extremal types theorem will hold. And if this limit is not equal to, not equal to 0, then the extremal types theorem will not hold. Okay. Okay, so let's see what happens, okay? Now, capital F, as, it, as I told you before, is the CDF of X. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's the probability that X Okay.
this is by the complement rule, right? Because one, one minus the probability of this is the same as the probability that x is greater than a minus one, okay? Okay, now, but we know that the possible values x can take are from zero to m. So, so if x is greater than m minus one, the only value you can take is, is what, is, Do you, do you guys follow my argument here? Yeah. Yes. I don't get how you know you went from from the probability of uh, x bigger than n minus one. How how that equal to the probability of, the, of x, x equal to n? That's what I'm explaining, sir. Because the the, the values in f okay the the values the variable can take is from zero one up to m. So if x is greater than m minus 1, the only value you can take is m. Oh, oh yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. Is that clear, guys, or not? Because you can only take integer values from 0, 1, 2, up to m. Okay? So if x is greater than m minus 1, m is an integer, right? The only value you can take is m. Yeah. So, okay? So, so this is equal to one, which is different from zero. So, extremal types theorem will not hold. This is clear, guys, or not? Let me know. It's not clear, guys. So, I want to do many examples as I can today. Uh, the next, the next one I'm going to do. Example three. Here you have uh, x1 to xn, which are iid, with the probability x equal to k equals to 1 over capital N, no relation to little n, all right? For k from 1 to capital N. This is known as the discrete, uh, I don't know whether you've you probably seen it before. It's known as the discrete uniform distribution, all right? The question is, does the ATP hold? All right, once again, the first thing to do is to work out W of F. So, as I, as I argued here, W of F is usually the, the largest point of the domain. What's the domain here? The domain is from 1 to N. 
So in this case, the largest point of the domain is capital N, right? Okay. Okay. So, so we want to. Now we know this is one over m. Okay. Now the f capital F at n, n minus one is the sum of the density from 1 to n minus 1, right? Now, what is this equal to this? This is, this is a constant, right, with respect to i. So you're summing the constant from 1 to n minus 1. What would that give you? Talk to me, guys. This is a constant, right? Yes, so, so you're summing a constant from 1 to n minus 1. So that will give you hmm, n minus 1. Yeah. Is that right? And this is 1 over m divided by 1 over n, which is 1 which is not equal to zero. Okay. So <coughs> is that is that clear guys or now? Do you know I mean to sum a constant Right, if you sum a constant from 1 to n minus 1, it's simply n minus 1, because there are n minus 1 terms here from 1 to this. So n minus 1 times the constant, right? Okay, so, so that's example 3. Alright, the next one, the next example is a tricky one. So in this case, you have the data come from a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. Sure, all of you know the Poisson, right? Yeah. So this, um, the density of the Poisson distribution is, let me write it down, is probability x equal to k is e minus lambda. This is the density of the Poisson distribution, right? 
Now looking, looking at the domain, the domain is from 0, 1, 2 up to infinity, right? So the W of F will be what? Will be infinity, right? So will be infinity. So we need to find we need to find the limit as k goes to infinity of the probability that x equal to k divided by f k minus 1. Okay. And this is this is not a trivial Finding the limit of this is not easy, and that's why you need to go through some process. Sometimes finding the limit is, I'm, I'm sure all of you have done calculus, sometimes finding the limit is easy, sometimes it's not easy. So, okay, I want to show you how to do this, all right? So, let me... Yes. So, so this will be Do you follow my argument that you should take 1 minus the probability that x is less than equal to k minus 1 that's the same as the probability that x is greater than equal to k. Yeah? Okay. So, And you can write the probability that x is greater than or equal to k as the sum of the probabilities x equal to i, i from k to infinity. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, now I'm gonna, this is why I'm gonna put the, the actual formulas in. Right, so you have two terms are common, right? So I'm going to cancel them. Okay? You follow me? So I'm, I'm doing it slowly so that you can follow, you can follow what, I hope you follow what I'm doing. If, if you don't, please let me know. Okay? So, so this becomes limit as k goes to infinity these two terms cancel okay okay so you have on the top you have lambda power k yeah and the k factorial I'm gonna bring it
like this. Okay. Are you with me so far? Let me know. If, do you have any questions so far? Yes. No. Yes. Come on, guys. Talk to me, guys. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. Now. So, so what you have is the following, is the limit Now, k factorial is all the numbers from 1 to k 1 times 2 times up to k, right? This is k factorial. Now i factorial is all the numbers up to up to i, okay? Times lambda power i. This is what you have. Because i is greater than or equal to k, so i has to be, i is a, i is a number that is at least as big as k right so you have all the numbers from 1 to k multiplied together and all the numbers from 1 to i multiplied together right you see what i'm saying okay so so what you have um What you have is the following. The, the a lot of I mean all these terms here will cancel out with all these terms here. They will cancel out. Okay? So only so the only terms that don't cancel out, right, will be will be the following. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because this, this are all the terms from 1 to k. This is 1 to i. So all these terms will cancel out with all these terms. So the, the ones which you do not cancel out will be the terms over here. These terms will not cancel out. It will be k plus 1 to i. Yeah? Okay? All right. Okay, now... The next thing, okay, let me take this out and put it here so you can hopefully see this. One. The next thing is, um, I'm going to write You see what I've done. I have I have written k plus one as k plus one. I have written i in place of i. I have written k plus i minus k, which is the same as i. Okay. Okay. Now. Uh, okay. The next thing is. next thing I'm going to do is, is the following. What uh, about each of, if you look at each of these terms, k plus 1 is greater than or equal to k. 
and this term is also greater than or equal to k right okay now can i ask how many terms you have in the denominator here k plus 1 to k plus i minus k how many there are there are i minus k terms right are you follow are you are you are you tired or what <laughs> I mean, k plus 1 to k plus i minus k, there are i minus k terms, right? And each of them is greater than or equal to k, right? So that means I mean, if you, please, if you do not follow this, let me know. I want you to understand this clearly. Do, do you see what I've done? I have I have taken the fact that each of these terms is greater than equal to k. So so if you, if you take the product of all the k's, you get this. k to the power i minus k, right? And this must be greater than or equal to this because if the product is greater than or equal to k, then one over the product will be less than or equal to that. And but you also have lambda k to the divided by that, so it will be greater than or equal to that. Yeah. Try to think what I'm saying, please. Um, and finally, so not finally yet. We have some way to go. Um, two guys cancel okay so what you get I know it's a really really long calculations but I'm, I'm, I'm doing it in a slow phase that's why it's long but usually, usually it's not that this long so this would be the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 divided by i from k to infinity of lambda divided by k to the power i minus k. Okay, now I'm going to make a substitution. Set m equal to i minus k. Okay, if you set I, m equal to i minus k, this will become the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 divided by m equal to 0 to infinity of lambda over k power m. Do you know something about this series? This is a well-known series in algebra or calculus. What is this known as? Come on guys, don't tell me you don't know. But have you seen this series before? Um, you must have, I think, if you have something like say z power m m from zero to infinity this is equal to what you, you don't know this this is known as the geometric series yeah okay so 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 this is the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 divided by 1 sorry 1 so 1 divided by 1 divided by 1 minus lambda divided by k okay right i know so as k goes to infinity this goes to this goes to 0 all right so that so so this is equal to 1 
All right. So what we have shown, I know it's a long calculator, three pages of calculations. I won't, <laughs> so I won't ask you this in the exam. So what we have shown is that the limit of the probability that x we have shown that this is greater than or equal to 1. So this implies that hence Right, so is that I know this I will not ask you this question, but but I hope you understood the the, the derivations yeah it's it's just using i mean it's, there's nothing really complicated, it's just a matter of using the technical skills that you learned in your first year, uh, especially in your first year calculus courses now. Um, is to show that we have shown that the limit is greater than or equal to 1, so hence the ETT cannot hold, right? All right, so what's the time now? Is it 10 minutes? What's the time? Is it 10? Huh? 4? A quarter to five. Okay, so we have time. All right, so uh, maybe I can do it just. So that's example four, right? So I'll just do example five. Right. So this is a simpler one. So you have a data from a discrete distribution with the probability equal to half if k is minus one or plus one and is zero otherwise. Right. Okay. So the first thing you need to figure out is the w of f. What what would it be? Hmm? W1, right? Because the domain of the definition is minus 1 or plus 1, and the largest point is 1, right? So WFF is 1. So, so you need to find the limit as k approaches 1 of the probability that x equal to k divided by. Okay. And this is the probability that x equal to 1 divided by 1 minus f at 0. Now the probability x equal to 1 is half, right? Now what is, what is f of 0? Remember, f is the CD of, CD of f 0 is? is half, yeah, it's also half, yeah, because remember, it's, it's all the probabilities, I mean, the, the only number that is less than or equal to zero is minus one, 
and the, prob the probability of that is half. So the CDF at zero is half two. Yeah, so this is one, which is not equal to zero, and All right, guys, so I'll stop here. So at 5 o'clock, we will uh, go to the next, ro next room, 209, and do the example sheet. I assume all of you have the problem sheet with you, right? The one I gave you yesterday. Yes, so try to, try to work through the one, the, the problems I gave you. Okay. okay. All right, guys. So I'll see you guys in, in 10 minutes. So we'll start in about 10 minutes from now, okay?